This is the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast, episode number 89 with guest Christine Arilo. All links and resources you hear in this podcast can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 89. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. As always, I'm very excited to have you here and to introduce you to today's guest. But before I do that, last week, if you listened to the podcast, you probably heard my request And I'm going to ask you again, just to make sure, for those of you that may have missed it, we are taking just a quick little survey here over at Your Kick-Ass Life, and we want to know just a couple of questions. And to easily do this, you can either reply to the email that you got that contained this podcast or shoot us an email at support at your kick ass life. We want to know if you had a very favorite guest here on the podcast, one that maybe you have listened to that podcast episode six times, you tell all your friends about it. Who is that? Tell me if you had a favorite guest and you want to have that person on again. I'd be more than happy to have them on again to have part two of their talk. And I would also be interested to know if you have a favorite, because you know around here about every other week I do a solo episode where I basically have a blog post and I read it to you for lack of a better explanation there. And it's kind of, you know, me going on a rant. It's a little mini rant there. Sometimes I give you the smackdown. And that's just a solo episode. And then, of course, I have guest episodes like you're going to hear today. If you much more love my solo episodes or if you would much rather me have guests, just let me know. I just really want to make sure that I'm serving you, that I'm giving you guys exactly what you want. If you love my Smackdowns, maybe if I get the majority of those answers, maybe I'll do, you know, three of those a month and then just one guest episode. I don't know yet, but I definitely want to hear from you, my ass kickers, whom I love so, so, so much. And let us know what you want. So that's support at yourkickasslife.com or just hit reply when you get one of the emails that has this podcast episode in there. And we'll be sure to jot that down. We will probably not be able to reply to every single one of you, but we so appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much for listening. And let me tell you a little bit about Christine. Christina Rilo, inspirational catalyst, best-selling author, and spiritual advocate, is on a mission to create a new reality for women and girls, one based on true feminine power, freedom, and self-love, instead of the relentless pursuit of unsustainable pressure of having to do, be, and have it all. She's written two best-selling books, Choosing Me Before We and Madly in Love with Me, The Daring Adventure to Becoming Your Own Best Friend. Her opinions and transformational techniques have been featured on CBS, ABC, Fox, WGN, E, and the Huffington Post, and on radio shows, spas, conferences, and stages all around the world, including TEDx. So without further ado, my ass kickers, here is Christine. Welcome, everyone. I am very excited, as always, for today's guest. We are on episode 89 already of the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. Thank you for being here. Today, I welcome Christine Arilo. Hey, Christine. Hey there, everyone. Hi. Hi, hi. Oh, say hi to my ass kickers. I call them my lady ass kickers. <laughs> Hello, lady ass kickers. I hope they're not kicking your own ass. <laughs> no, no, it's all coming from a place of love as always. And awesome. That is a great segue to today's topic. And Christine is the queen of self-love. I don't, I'm sure I'm not the first person that's called you that, but self-love, I feel like is one of those kind of topics du jour of personal development. And it's really it's a term that gets thrown around a lot lately, but I think a lot of people, it's sort of obscure. So let's start there. What is self-love in your words? So like, what does it mean to actually love yourself? Mm-hmm. I'll just need to start about the piece that self-love is kind of obscure. And it, it is something that gets thrown a lot around like, oh, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. So and, and then, you know, for me, how I did not like, you know, take a course to be called the queen of self-love, you know, to necessarily <laughs> become the queen of self-love. But what happened for me 
back in, gosh, now it was like 2001, I came to this realization about myself based on a series of circumstances that included a broken engagement that I had a lot of self-esteem, but I didn't love myself. Mm -hmm. So I started asking people how to love yourself. Like, what does that mean? And I asked my relatives the first question, bad idea, because they're like, well, you know, stop asking yourself such weird questions, Christine, like, just be happy. And I'm like, yeah, not working. Mm -hmm. (laughs) working. Let me just snap my fingers and make that happen. Yeah. And then I started asking, you know, different spiritual teachers and I get these obtuse, you know, things like, well, you know, be kind to yourself and, you know, be compassionate. And I'm like, okay, great. And how do you do that? And how do you know? How do I know that I am loving myself? And how do I know that I'm not loving myself? And I just couldn't get like a clear definitive answer. And I like to know, like I wanted to know whether I was doing it or not doing it. And if I was doing it well, because obviously it was something I needed to focus on. So I just started actually my own experimentation on it because no one could really define it for me. And over the course of years, I started to see what it was and what it wasn't and how it worked. And from there, started developing these techniques and exercises to use on myself. And from that came a really clear understanding of what self-love is. So I'll give you all my definition of it because mm-hmm. I do have a specific yeah. definition. Because if you actually go on to dictionary.com and type in the word self-love, the definition you'll get is narcissism, mm-hmm. conceit, and vanity. <laughs> I do know that. Which, it up. Which, and what's crazy is that it's also in the, all the psychological texts and the way that our psychological, like, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists, they hold it. It's defined as narcissism. Mm-hmm. So if you just think about that for a second, if you can imagine back in the 1960s before self-esteem became popular, what if we define self-esteem as narcissism in our culture? Like, that's kind of where we're at with self-love. So let me just I'll give you the definition. Everyone close your eyes because this is one you want to feel. Put your hand on your heart. And here is what self-love is. Self-love is the unconditional love and respect that you give to yourself that allows you to, no matter what, only choose loving, respectful relationships and situations that honor your heart and soul. Wow, that's beautiful. And, you know, just to, to, to ground that even more in, if you think of the words self-love, so it's self-love, it's just love directed in a different direction. So if you were to just keeping your eyes closed for a moment, think about someone you really love. Like, just think about it right now, like someone you really, 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 really love, you love unconditionally. And just imagine yourself giving that person love and appreciation and compassion and, and, you know, empowerment. And then imagine that person just holding up a mirror and reflecting that same energy back to you. That's what self-love feels like. I imagine that a lot of the people listening feel like, in theory, that sounds really good, Christine, but it just is so massive. But they know it's a good idea and like they want to do it. So how do people actually do it? Like, do you have like a best practices first step? Yeah. So let me break it down for you all. Break it down. (laughs) I got excited thinking it was like a dance break. Yeah. So let me, well, we could do a dance break if you want to dance. Go right ahead. No problem. No problem. Let me me break it down. The way that I teach self-love and the way that I that I think is the easiest way to is I want you to imagine that like self-love is a tree and on this tree there's 10 branches and each of these branches of self-love you need for your tree for yourself to be healthy and whole and vibrant and if any of the branches of self-love are you know have been weed whacked or have not been nourished or nurtured your entire sense of self-love gets off and your sense of wholeness and self you know just gets weak so there are these 10 components of self-love there's self-awareness there's self-acceptance there's self-compassion there's self-care there's self-esteem self-empowerment self-expression self-trust and self and self-respect and self-honor and self-pleasure and then the roots of the tree are Mm self-worth and so one of the first steps in self-love and i'll give you two answers to this one is getting an understanding of where you're strong in self-love and where you're weak 
and self-love. So it's just like anything, right? You're strong in some places and you're weak in other places. It's why when people say, well, you know, do you love yourself? Well, it's really not that simple of an answer because of course there are ways that you totally do love yourself and treat yourself as someone that you love. And there are other ways where you're not as loving. So it's so important for us to be having this conversation. So I just want to underscore that. I work with so many girls and so many women that we just don't understand this. And so in our culture, it's like we're just on this crazy self-esteem track. It's like, okay, if I just have this confidence, if I just, you know, achieve, if I just, and it's, we're on this track of like, if I give and I give and I give, we're exhausting ourselves. It's almost backfiring. Well, it is backfiring. It's the unintended impact of culture totally focused on self-esteem. And if you look at the girls and the boys too, and we've done a lot of work inside of schools and also inside of different girls organizations, you see the pressure that these kids are under Mm -hmm. and that they put on themselves. And we've learned that a lot of the inner dialogue where it's not the self-loving voice that we call the inner meanie for kids or the inner mean girl or inner mean dude for boys and girls and adults starts as young as the age of eight, Mm -hmm. maybe even seven. And so the self-esteem isn't enough. So like, for example, like I've always had a high level of self-esteem, but the self-compassion piece made it so that even though I was successful at school and successful in my career, I was always hard on myself. I was never enough. Like it was never enough. Have to do more, have to be better, have to be, you know, the best. And so there was a way that I couldn't give myself a break, you know, it was just like, because that self-esteem was so relied on. Or I had high self-esteem, but I had low self-respect and honor. So what happened, and I see this a lot in women, is that they put themselves into their successful in their career, but a mess in their relationships. Mm -hmm. I see that a lot too. It's like we don't have a frame for like even understanding that. And when you are a person who does have high outward confidence, it's easier to actually hide the fact that you don't love yourself Mm -hmm. in these other ways. Because people just think, oh, she's confident. Oh, she's secure. Oh, she's successful. And I would say that some of the most outwardly successful women are some of the women that are the most hard on themselves and the most out of balance in their relationships and their self-care and their joy and all of the other components of self-love. I would absolutely agree with that. It just sounds like it's when your insides don't match your outsides. And I think for a lot of those women, and I'm sure there's a lot of women listening who feel that way, that it's almost, I feel like they're in a unique situation because for them to admit that they need help, there's almost a sense of shame around there. And Or people, when they do reach out for help or do tell their story to someone that they trust, sometimes they're met with people downplaying it or poo-pooing them or, or even like, a, what do you have to be, you know, how could you possibly feel that way? Like, like, look at what you've accomplished. Look at what everything you've attracted in your life and things like that. So I imagine that there are women that feel that way. Yeah, well, I haven't met a woman yet that has self-love lit, you know, because (laughs) that's the thing is that, you know, I I always say that self-love is a practice yes, and self-love is a choice. And I have found in my own life by being able to understand these different aspects, these different branches of self-love, I can identify at any given point, what's the self-love medicine I need, Right. So is whatever is happening in my life, do I need some self-acceptance? Like this mm-hmm. is one of the most self-acceptance is one of the most, I would say, self-acceptance, self-compassion and self-care are probably the three branches that I see are the weakest amongst women. And self-acceptance being to really, truly accept who you are and accept where you are and love being who you are, appreciate it, acknowledge it. And not want to be someone else. Like when you have strong self-acceptance, there is no comparison. Mm -hmm. And comparison is one of the most toxic habits that we have that really diminishes our self-love. There's so many toxic habits, but comparison is one of them. I know for myself and the people I've shared it with, like understanding this context really helps. And I would say that to also answer the question, is it another way to think about like, where do you start with self-love in addition to understanding where you're strong and you're weak at, is that the first vow of self-love, there's five major promises that I believe all women need to take and keep in order to have strong self-love. And the first one is, I will never settle for less than my heart and soul desire. 
And it would be good just to even write that down. So if you have a pen, like jot that down, mm-hmm. I will never settle for less than my heart and soul desire. And I'll just share a quick story about that is when I, in 2001, when I got the message that I didn't love myself, even though I had this you know high level of self-esteem, it came on the heels of a broken engagement that was not, I was not the one doing the breaking. So we all have our stories, right? There's always some catalyst that kind mm-hmm. of catapults you into an awareness <laughs> that, oh, maybe there's some stuff to work with inside there. <laughs> and I remember, and it was a 15 year relationship. We were like, you know, high school, boyfriend, girlfriend, grew up in college, lived together. I mean, for all practical purposes we were you know married even though we were mm-hmm. not legally married and on our way to that and so I remember having moved out of my house and I was living with a good friend of mine at the time I was laying in bed and I had that feeling you know when you go through a breakup where you feel like you have that hole in your heart where you like feel like you're gonna ripped. die yeah I think yeah. we all know that feeling that one the feeling that like one. you're gonna die from heartbreak mm-hmm. exactly and all that you know so so crazy because I had always believed in the past whenever we had broken up or gotten into fights or whatever that that was him missing. Like the heartbreak was because he wasn't in there. But on this specific day when I was really listening to my inner wisdom and that voice said, you know, Christine, you have a lot of self-esteem, but you don't love yourself. The voice went on to say, and that heart, that hole that you feel isn't him missing. It's you missing. And the truth is that you not only almost married the wrong person, but you almost created a life that didn't match what your heart and soul really desired because you needed and wanted the love of someone else. And so that was a very drastic way. Like we do it to please other people, right? To get love, to get recognition. Like there's so many ways in which you can be living your life and making life choices that aren't in alignment with your heart and soul. And so what I realized, and that's when the voice said, you need to take this promise to never settle for less than your heart and soul desire because you almost, you know, stayed in Chicago, married this guy, would have ended up living in the suburbs and working and selling cheese for a living. Like that was what I was getting my MBA and I was probably headed towards selling not even real cheese, like working for craft, you know, <laughs> that was kind of the options, you know, in the Midwest. <laughs> Can you imagine selling fake cheese, like, and spending your whole life selling fake cheese and tartar sauce and, like, you know, spending your life that way? Ah! But my soul had always wanted to live in California, and I wanted to work in fashion, and I wanted to live in the city. And there's not that there's anything wrong with living in the suburbs or even, you know, working for crap if that's what your heart and soul desires. But so many of us are, we're just, I was so out of tune with my heart and soul. I had never listened to my heart and soul. Like, how do you even do that? Mm-hmm. And that became my first gate of self-love. I was like, okay, really going to listen to what my heart and soul desire. And that's been a lifelong practice now for what, you know, a long time where I'm actually constantly listening to my heart and soul. And I just got back from a four day visioning retreat in the mountains to listen to my heart and soul about what I'm wanting to create for the next three years of my life and my work and how I live. So there's this way that I'm now in constant communication with that. And I've made that promise and I've never broken it in all of this time. And it's what's allowed me now to be here with all of you having, you know, written books and become the queen of self-love and creating a self-love day and living around the world with my now soul partner, Noah, like all of these dreams have come to fruition because of that one promise, which going back to self-acceptance means that it's my heart and soul. So what's right for me is not right for you. When you have that strong self-acceptance, connected to a strong sense of self-empowerment, which is knowing that you're the queen, the sovereign of your own life, the monarch of your dreams, and you go for it no matter what. Um, Having those two branches so strong, I've been able to step out of kind of the normal, you know, day-to-day mundane life and really create the life that my heart and soul truly desired. Wow. That is a great, I love your story. And I, there's so many little nuggets in there. And you guys, if you are in your car or if you are working out and you want some of the, the show notes that have links back to Christine's blog posts, et cetera, it's at yourkickasslife.com forward slash 89 is where you can get everything. And Christine, you and I have very similar stories. So I was in a 13 year relationship and we did get married and we were just about to start a family. I wasn't selling cheese though. I was, <laughs> I was in a- <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) industry. 
I was in the fashion industry before that, which was a big mistake. And I was, you know, again, not listening to my heart, but I, same thing, was brokenhearted. My husband, we were just about to start a family and my husband left me for our neighbor and got her pregnant. And I remember that feeling of like, feeling like that hole. And I also was sitting in a counselor's office and she's talking to me about life and, you know, trying to get through. And I mean, I was in the weeds. I was in the first week of it. And I remember she must have mentioned two or three times and I was frantically taking notes about what she was saying because she was this beautiful Indian woman and she was so wise. And I went back and read my notes and there was two or three times where she had mentioned self-love. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't even know what that is. And so for me, it was, I went to Barnes and Noble, got some self-help books (laughs) and started reading about it. And I remember For me, and this is definitely in hindsight, and this is what I say a lot is that, and I love your branches and they're all so very important. And that self-acceptance one, I believe is so important because I tell people who are in like those, just that depths of it, it's like, okay, put self-love to the side for a second and just focus on like creating a truce with yourself and just accepting and trying to practice self-compassion. And that whole just topic of, kind of like laying down the gloves for a minute. You don't have to throw them off, (laughs) lay them down and just accept. I mean, even if you just accept where you are, because some people are in denial and it just really is about, yeah, you have to go through the muck of it all. But I think that if many of us focused on self-acceptance before self-love, then you will get those baby steps that you need to get to that place that you described, that beautiful, beautiful place that you described. And I also love that you said that it's like a one day, I call it a one day at a time gig because we don't, none of us really ever arrive. I mean, you have to choose every day to get up in the morning and cause shit still happens. Like I'm sure you still, you know, life isn't perfect over there with Noah. Like, <laughs> I make up that you probably still have stuff that comes up and you have to choose and use your tools. I do. Well, and I think of it as medicine. So it's like we were just saying, it's like if you know you need self-acceptance or self-compassion, it's actually knowing which medicine you need, Mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, oh, like if I need self-acceptance, which really so many of us, and this is a big place I see, and I definitely have this one totally still happens for me, is the self-judgment, which is a lack of self-acceptance. And when we're judging ourselves that things should be different somehow than they are, That is a total, can you imagine like if your child came home and was like, you know, mom, I'm having like a really hard time at school and I just like, I don't really get this math thing and it's like just really hard and I got to see on my paper or whatever. And you were like, well, you f***ing loser. Oops, sorry. (laughs) You're like, you know, you you loser. The Chicago girl in me comes out sometimes. You know, you loser, but we do that to ourselves, right? You f***ing loser. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, get your shit together and you better get an A next time and you should be smarter and you should should know better so and so right and then you can put the comparison in well you know your brother is smarter than your sister so like one of the ways i really and this is where the inner mean girl work comes out so you know for me my mission in life is to create a world in which every child is born connected to love and stays connected to love so that no matter what happens to that child, like as mothers and aunties and godmothers, we can't protect our children. that They're never going to have things that happen to them that aren't hard and that don't break their heart and that don't scare them. Like that's just part of being on this crazy planet. But if we can for ourselves learn how to always feel connected to love or teach our children that they are, they have their own source of love. Just think about the decisions you would have made differently, right? If you had trusted your voice, if you had chosen to listen to your own inner wisdom versus follow the crowd, or if you didn't have that inner mean girl who was silently beating you up for everything that you're not, or if she did, you were able to actually work with that part of you and love that part of you. These are common experiences that we have all over the world. And so for me, I, this is why I've dedicated my life to self-love is that I really, I always say, by the time I leave the planet, I want self-love to be as understood as normal as table salt. Mm -hmm. So it's understood, it's embraced, it's taught, it's practiced, and we need to break it down. Otherwise, as we said in the very beginning, it's just like this conversation of like, 
oh, like, love yourself, love yourself. And if you think about there's that one commandment, right, that says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, Mm -hmm. which is good advice, right? But if you think about that for a moment, no wonder our whole freaking world is out of (laughs) whack because, like, most people don't actually love themselves so well. Right, right. (laughs) They're actually, yeah, they're actually honoring the commandment by not treating people well. Yeah, they're they're following that. And so Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, everyone, because when I was asked to, you know, when spirit kind of said to me, Christine, quit your high paying corporate job and go out and talk about self love. I was like, no, I can't do that. People will think I'm weird. People will think I'm hippy dippy. People will think I'm, you know, fluffy. And I did, I got these, like these comments back, like, well, you know, self love, do you mean like masturbation or do you like, like, what is it really? (laughs) No kidding. No kidding. Those are comments I would get. And I just can't tell you now, I've been on a very deep spiritual path. I mean, I have a very deep, divine, feminine, spiritual path that I'm on of honoring the feminine inside of myself. And I've just done the most deep spiritual work to be able to support and work with other people. But it all, the foundation is self-love. And it's not weird. Like, you would never say to someone, oh, you know, loving other people, like, that's hippy-dippy. That's weird. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. like... That's selfish. That's selfish. If we think about it that way, it's like, well, this should be something that we actually learn about and we know about. Just like we think about how do we keep our bodies fit physically, this is a way that we keep ourselves inside fit mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. I often think like if we learned self-compassion and self-love and self-acceptance as children, like we learned our times tables, like with flashcards, like Mm -hmm. imagine how different I think the world would vibrate differently. I think we would have a completely different world, completely different. We would. We've done tests. So on February 13th, that's the International Day of Self-Love, which you are all invited to celebrate and honor. Of course, it's the day before Valentine's Day on purpose. (laughs) And last year we did a pilot with 160 kids, boys and girls inside of a Chicago magnet school. And as part of the prep, the whole month, they each like day, they did a different branch of self-love and they had exercises and questions. And 13th of February on self-love day, they had a big assembly and they all took the promise to give up negative self-talk. And they we gave them stickers that said, be kind to you. That's my friend you're talking to. And we gave them permission to when they heard one of their friends beating themselves up, you know, having that inner meanie, inner mean girl, inner mean dude, you know, saying these negative things, being hard on them, judging themselves, etc. They had permission to tell their friends like, hey, be kind to you. That's my friend you're talking to. I love that. And it was wild, you all, because these are boys and girls in Chicago. It worked. What ended up happening, so I went back to the talk to the teachers in April, and they were all like, it was amazing, Christine. These kids, like, I would walk past down the hallway, and they would be saying, don't say that to yourself. Like, be kind to yourself. Like, they were doing it in the moment and able to give voice to these things instead of just letting them fester inside of them. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I love that. Oh, I'm so glad that you stopped working at the cheese factory, Christine. (laughs) I never went to the cheese factory. I did escape the cheese factory and I did end up working in fashion too. So it's another connection between the two of us. Oh, buddy. Okay. Well, I have one more question for you before we wrap it up. And I like to ask this of all of my guests. I would love to know what surprises you about the work you do with women. Very good question. I've done a gazillion interviews. No one has ever asked me that. I like to surprise people with it. I like it. Yeah, it's a good question. It gives me pause, which is a good thing for us to practice as women, the pause. I think that the thing that has surprised me and really warmed my heart the most is that if you had met me pre-self-love, you would have, I was the kind of girl who had a lot of male friends. I had some girlfriends that were close, but I didn't really let a lot of women in very close. Mm -hmm. And I had to have known you like, you know, forever (laughs) in order for that to happen. And as I began to love myself and as I remember the, I went to this retreat and I sat in a circle of women. And as I started to open up my own heart to myself and I started to open up my own heart to the more feminine parts of me, I learned that I loved being in sisterhood Mm -hmm. with other women. And I don't mean sisterhood like just like, hey, let's go out and hang out and have a good time. I meant being like in circle with women that were willing to be honest and vulnerable and courageous and real. 
And so over the last decade or so, as I've been working with women, what always surprises me and keeps me doing the work that I do is seeing the power of what happens when women come together in circle. And so whether that's, you know, a weekend retreat that I do or a nine month program that we do together, or even like a one day, you know, workshop did one in New York and the shift that takes place when we just tell the truth and we let down all of those shields and the healing and the energy that happens, it's so powerful. And we just don't, I think it's one of the things that we have lost as women in our feminine power and also why we all, so many of us feel overwhelmed is because we lose that. We don't have those structures of being in circle and sisterhood. And so I think that's the thing that has surprised me the most is I always say when women come together, shift happens mm-hmm. of just how true that is and how powerful it is just by being in circle and being willing to open our hearts to ourselves and to each other. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. I'm so happy to know that it made you pause to really think about that. And I couldn't agree more with you. There's so much power in that in-person connection of just getting to tell your story to people that you trust, the people that have earned the right to hear it and that can be there for you. So thank you for that. That was gorgeous. Yeah, it's really important to be seen. That's one of the big things I realized when I was in my former relationship was I just wanted him to see me so deeply, but the trouble was is I didn't see myself. Mm-hmm. You got to see yourself first in order for somebody else to really see you. Yeah. Well, even you know, on this podcast, you're all connected. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if we're not in person, what's wonderful about this technology is right now there are women all around the world listening to this too. And so just to take a moment and breathe that into your heart to feel that you are connected to women all over the place listening to the same thing right now, other women who do want to, you know, live in alignment with their heart and soul and to just feel that and know that you're not alone on this journey and you don't have to do it alone. You can't do it alone. And there's just so much love here. I mean, you just have to open up your heart to let it in. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. I have loved this chat with you. And so if I am correct, you're at madlyinlovewithme.com, correct? Yes, that is the official self-love website is madlyinlovewithme.com. And then there's also my personal website, which is christinarilo.com. And all of those links, everybody, is at yourkickasslife.com forward slash 89. And I love your International Self-Love Day. And I know that you and I are on the same page with the whole, like, we need to change the dictionary definition of self-love. Change.org actually is a place to do that. <laughs> oh, there's a place you can do that. Yeah, you like I think that you just have to get a certain amount of people to sign the petition and oh. that's it. All right. Well, I'm going to get on that. Thank you for that. I'm always like, I'm like, who do I talk to to change this definition? Because it's Webster. wrong. No, it's, yeah, change.org can probably, I don't know. I don't know if they change. You have to look well, into it a little more. It's a good start. Thank good you. Start. I'm going to follow up on that one. Okay, good. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. Yourkickasslife.com forward slash 89 for all the show notes and links. And until next time, everybody, I will see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 